All right, so at this time, I am delighted to introduce our guest speakers for the Flipping Stigma, from the Flipping Stigma Action Group, Lynn Jackson and Myrna Norman. So Lynn Jackson began her career as a registered nurse. She is a proud member of the Métis Nation of BC with six generation roots stemming from the Manitoba Cree. And Lynn was diagnosed with dementia in 1999. Her current interests include advocating for people with dementia, and increasing awareness of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. She has spoken locally, nationally, and internationally to promote better diagnosis, access to treatment, and inclusiveness. And Lynn has taken a particular interest in breaking the stigma surrounding a diagnosis of dementia. So thank you, Lynn. We're so happy to have you here today. And then Myrna is joining us. Myrna Norman has been living with dementia for the past 14 years. She is a published author. She served many years as a member of the Alzheimer's Society of BC's leadership group, is a passionate dementia advocate, and she's a regular guest, guest on our society's lived experience webinars. So thank you so much for that, Myrna. Myrna also volunteers with the Purple Angel Dementia Support Program in Maple Ridge, BC, and she's been recognized as a community champion by the city of Maple Ridge. And so please uh, welcome and say a big hello to Lynn and Myrna. Um, thank you both for being here today to talk about a very important uh, subject of stigma and discrimination. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little bit of an intro uh, to what we're doing here today. So this webinar is part two of a four-part Flipping Stigma webinar series, and the team members of the Flipping Stigma on its Ear Toolkit, including action group members who live with dementia and researchers, will be invited to each one of these webinars to help us explore the toolkit and share their stories and experiences. So the aim of this series is really to educate and raise awareness about dementia to bring about change in attitude, break down stereotypes, and take action against stigma. So we do encourage you to please visit the Flipping Stigma page on the Society's website for more information on the webinar series and upcoming sessions. So you can do that by going to alzbc.org slash flipping dash stigma, and it's on the screen as well. And then the Flipping Stigma Toolkit, which is really what we're here to celebrate today, is an online tool that everybody can use. So its purpose is to recognize and respond to stigma and discrimination. It has been designed by people living with dementia to help others, and all of the information provided in this toolkit is from the perspective of people living with dementia. I think that's one of the greatest features of this toolkit is that embedded throughout are the voices and real life experiences of people living with dementia, which are captured in both audio and video clips. So it's very much unlike any other resources that I have uh, known because it truly, truly has that voice um, all throughout it. And the World Health Organization identified the toolkit as one of the top 10 tools to foster inclusion, which I think speaks to how powerful this tool can be. And so we, again, encourage you to visit uh, flippingstigma.com. The image on your screen is what the homepage will look like when you go to the website. And if you want to learn a bit more about how to use the online toolkit effectively, there is a wonderful tutorial video um, that the group has created. And we've linked that in the helpful resources document for you, which will be found in the chat box. So that will help just make sure you get the most um, out of the toolkit. And then for this webinar, so in webinar one, we discussed the real life examples of stigma and discrimination that many people living with dementia were facing. And we discussed some of the ways that you can respond to that. And there is a recording of that webinar, which can be found on the on-demand section of the society's website. And then in today's webinar, we're gonna talk with action group members, Lynn and Myrna, who share their experiences throughout the toolkit and really helped uh, create it along with the entire development, which, what was it, three? Three years. Three years. Yeah. yeah. So very big project. And both Lynn and Myrna's stories are featured in the Flipping Stigma in Action films, which can be found under the education and advocacy section of the toolkit. And I want to say I just I love these films. I can't say uh, more about them. I found them touching, informative, inspiring. And there's not a lot of 
of films uh, showing what it's like to live with dementia. And so I'm really happy that we're going to be showcasing them today. So thank you both um, for sharing your stories with us. And I'm going to now uh, stop sharing the PowerPoint so that we can hear more from Lynn and Myrna about their experiences. Oh. Are you on the big screen, Myrna? <laughs> <laughs> This is my office where I leave all my materials for all the things I'm involved with. Pardon me for the mess. That's all right. We're just glad you're here with us. So um, Lynn and Myrna, you're both very passionate uh, dementia advocates. And I'd love to start by knowing a bit more about why it was important for you to be part of the Flipping Stigma Action Group and to take a stand against stigma and discrimination. And so Myrna, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, you know, when I was diagnosed with dementia, I did what most people do and sort of cocoon myself. And and then at some point, I realized that I needed some help. And what I learned was that I was self-stigmatizing. I was believing the stuff that's out there that said, you know, just go home and get your affairs in order and, and get ready to die. So by becoming involved in something that I knew was going to be helpful in in it's really important for me as a citizen to give back. I had so many people give to me throughout my life. And, and so it was, it was my ultimate, uh, you can tell I have dementia because I get stuck for words. I really needed to become involved and I really needed to advocate for other people so they didn't fall into that trap. Um, so advocacy came, became my middle name, and any time I was asked to do something, I would take part in it. Thank you so much. It's such an important cause, and I know how much work went into the creation of this toolkit. Um, and Lynn, I'd like to ask you the same question. Just um, why was it important for you to be part of the Flipping Stigma Action Group? And why is it so important to take a stand against stigma and discrimination? Well, for me, combating stigma, uh, stigma associated with dementia has always been uh, important to me since day one when I was diagnosed. Because we, the people diagnosed, are a group of people who we really don't have a very big voice. Many of us are losing our words. It's difficult to speak publicly. Others never did speak publicly and they're not about to start, you know, after they're diagnosed. So those of us who can speak uh, need to make the effort to speak out on behalf of other people. And as for the uh, Flipping Stigma Toolkit, in the beginning, we didn't know how it would turn out. They told us it would be a three-year project, and the first thing that came to my mind was, how am I going to be in three years? You know, am I going to be able to participate? Um, it was the beginning of COVID. It was a time where, you know, we weren't doing anything. So it was a great time to be able to meet twice a week uh, on Zoom. And we really got the work started and done. And during that time, our relationships with each other, the researchers and the other people with dementia really melded. And uh, we, be we became a really good group um, to, to, do, to do this work. And, and we knew that we needed to keep our brains active. And um, that we wanted to tell the stories of, about people with dementia in our own words. You know, you often see people with dementia in the later stages, and um, people believe that that's what uh, it means. But um, we need, so we need to break down those stereotypes. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Um, both of those were so well said. And I can testify, I've had the privilege of uh, attending a few um, functions and meetings with the action group members. And the connection that you guys formed over those three years is incredible. It truly felt like you were um, you know, part of a family together. And I could just see how, how meaningful that work was to all of you. And we know, like I've heard many times that due to stigma associated with dementia or memory loss, that it can be really uh, difficult for people to publicly share their diagnosis. So they may fear that they'll be treated differently or excluded from activities that they enjoy if they go public. And so I'd really love to, to hear from both of you 
What advice would you give to someone who was recently diagnosed with dementia who might be worried about how they'll be treated after disclosing their diagnosis to family members or friends? Um, Myrna, do you mind speaking to that a little bit? Um, what would you say to somebody who is newly diagnosed and is afraid to talk about it? Oh, for sure. I've been there, done that, and at times still feel like I'm in that place. It's difficult um, because you first have to admit it to yourself. Um, you have to, to your education, you have to talk to your your spouse and, and the rest of your family and sort of come to terms with it yourself. And if you have to yell and cry, then yell and cry. Um, remember, um, after we sort of have that initial period of getting over the shock, then we need to think about what we want to do with with this diagnosis. And, and we have choices. I believe we have the choice to to live happily or or just to stay wrapped up in front of the television. We're all different. We all have to do what we have to do. And I think that's really important. The other thing is we probably will run into stigma from time to time. And it's sad and it can hurt right to the bottom of your soul. But you know what? We're resilient and we can get over it. And, and it's the person who makes the remark, who makes you feel stigmatized, is the one that needs the help. Um, we're, we're doing a good job. The one thing doctors never tell us is, is to have hope. And hope is so important. With hope, we can live better lives. We can deal with stigma better. Actually, um, my first flight after I was diagnosed, I had my little card that said, uh, please be patient, I have dementia. And I was treated royally. So um, I, have a, I have no problem telling people that I have dementia. And then if I might want to make a silly remark, I can just remind them, it's okay, I have dementia, I can do that. So, so I put it kind of on a different scale and, and worked very hard at trying to be trying to live well and keep a sense of humor and play with my life. I think we can tell that you bring uh, so much joy to everything that you do and you truly do have that sense of humor um, at all times. And thank you for sharing that because I think maintaining that sense of humor when you can is so important along this journey. Um, and you had mentioned to me a specific example um, from your life, which I think might be helpful for people in the audience to understand what discrimination is like. And this happened to you when you were attending an exercise class. Do you mind sharing that, that example with us? Certainly. Um, I had had a stroke amongst that period of time. And, and so I had some generalized weakness. And I, so I had to attend the hospital um, exercise group for quite a while. And I was still, I'm quite competitive, although nobody knows that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was working really hard at trying to stay par with somebody else that was doing really well too. And in our exercise group, um, different people would take times to count out the exercises. And one day it was my turn. And most people in there knew that I had dementia and it had never been a problem. But this particular time I was counting and I suppose I must have mixed up my numbers. And the gentleman next to me, gentleman perhaps, a, a, a sentence that perhaps didn't fit him, um, he, he turned to me and he said, what the hell's the matter with you? Have you got dementia? And for somebody who tries to always see the positive, I could not. I could not return to that class, although the, the instructor called me several times. Um, I just, the hurt was so painful um, and people need to know that, but I have surpassed it, it took time. Thank you for, for sharing that example. I think it helps us put into perspective what people living with dementia can face um, and the things that they do have to overcome in order to continue to participate and stay engaged. Um, Lynn, I'd love to ask you the, the same question. So just advice that you'd like to give to somebody who is recently diagnosed, um, if they were worried about how they may be treated by their family or friends. Well, in my case, I, I usually try to let any comments or looks just roll off my back and not let, try not to let, to let it bother me. 
Um, you know, my family and friends know that I'm really trying my best. Uh, if I need help, I ask for help. And talking was more beneficial for me and others than not talking about it. So uh, that was a big help. And when I was diagnosed and telling friends and family, they didn't really know what to say to me. I found I did most of the talking to them about my disease and um, telling them about some information that I found on the internet. And by talking, I made them see I was comfortable talking about it and it made to it let them feel more comfortable talking about it. And then also I found joining a support group was invaluable. Being with other people diagnosed was um, a, a real lifesaver for me. There's just strength in numbers. Thank you. I've heard you both share that sentiment about how important it is to be connected to others uh, with lived experience yeah. as you're going through this journey and just to talk about the things that other people truly can't understand unless they're walking it alongside you or with you or in your shoes. Um, so thank you. I think that's a, a few steps that people can take um, being open to starting that conversation, even if it's awkward at first, because we've heard from many people that it's, people are hesitant to start talking about it. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to offend, but by not talking about it, we have yeah. so much to lose um, as For well. Sure. Yes. Thank you both. Um, at this time, we would love to um, actually visit the Flipping Stigma website and share some of the um, action films that Lynn and Myrna both filmed. And so hopefully our uh, technology will be on our side um, and allow us to share those with you today. We did have a little bit of a lag earlier. Um, the sound was wonderful. So we do apologize if there's a bit of a lag in the picture. Hopefully you'll be able to hear um, the powerful words shared in, in the video though. Kim, do you want to walk through how to get to the videos while while I'm, are you seeing the yeah. uh, home so screen? When you go down to the home page, so this is what it will look like for you. If you just scroll down, you're actually going to see that there's three separate pathways that people can use to enter uh, the toolkit and the videos you're going to find in the pathway for people living with dementia under the education and advocacy heading. So they are the flipping stigma in action films. There's four of them. We're only going to show um, Myrna and Lynn's film today, but I strongly recommend checking them all out if you haven't had an opportunity to do so um, yet. And if there is any technical problems, please do go back and watch them because um, they're, they're absolutely beautiful films. Thanks, and I'm starting, I just wanna confirm, I'm starting with Lynn, correct? or Myrna? Uh, we will start with Lynn's video and I just want to uh, let the audience know that we'd love to hear any thoughts, feelings, um, questions that get stirred up as you're watching the video. Um, so please do feel free to use the chat box to provide any feedback um, or any questions that you have. From Borneo to Bangladesh to India, China, Europe, I'm a world traveler and I'm living with dementia. Hi, I'm Lynn Jackson. I have atypical frontal temporal dementia and uh, Parkinsonism. I was a registered nurse at the beginning of my career and then I went into the business side of medicine and sold uh, coronary angioplasty equipment in Mexico and South America. When I first was diagnosed, there weren't very many people who were diagnosed. There certainly wasn't a support group in Vancouver. So what I did was I went onto the internet and there I found a group of people in a chat room who were diagnosed, nine of us, and we formed our own group called Dementia Advocacy and Support Network International. And they uh, got me my first talking gig. And um, through, through that, uh, the word got out and um, I got involved with research projects. In one of the groups, we talked about um, compassionate curiosity, you know, how to 
approach people, you know, once they have a diagnosis. Um, they had um, a whole lot of questions about what's the most important uh, things about dementia, and stigma was number one. People are afraid uh, to talk to people with dementia. They either put you down or they say, oh yeah, that happens to me too, or oh, don't worry about that. But you know what, that's not what people want to hear. And, and what they think is they have that stereotype figure of somebody in a wheelchair drooling. I made a point of telling my friends what was wrong with me and um, all my little idiosyncrasies and what they could help me with. But most people don't do that. So I think that um, if people were to just ask questions that were heartfelt and um, you know, that they, they wanted to know about the person, the person would be very happy to share with them. I've done many, many projects over the years, and this one, the toolkit, is the one that has stuck with me the most and the one that I feel like we're going to get the most traction with and the most movement um, around the world with, and it's going to help a lot of people, and that makes me really happy. <laughs> It took quite a while. It was during COVID, and we could do it from our home over Zoom, and it, it worked well that way. I think that a big part of it was that we, we were asked the right questions to move us along so that we could take action and combat the stigma that is associated with dementia. It's been an eye-opener for a lot of people because a lot of people don't realize that dementia is the umbrella term for the various different types of dementia. What I like too about it is that uh, very quickly comes up a page where medical people can just review uh, what's important about when they're talking to people diagnosed with dementia. I would never have believed that I would have such a good life after a diagnosis of dementia. You know, you, you have that terrible feeling when you're diagnosed and you know oh my goodness what's going to happen to me you go through all the stages of anger and denial and bargaining and you know but then once you come to some sense of acceptance then you can move on my passion is traveling and um, what i do is travel to Alzheimer conferences around the world and I'd be asked to speak quite often. My doctor said to me, you know, Lynn, your treatment is very portable. Just put your medications into your carry-on and away you go. And that's what I did. That's a, such a powerful uh beautiful film there, uh, Lynn. And one of the things I love that you mentioned is about approaching people with curiosity. Compassionate um, curiosity, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Yeah. And asking them questions. How can I support you? What can we do? So that you can continue to do all, all the amazing things that, that you love to do. And when we were planning this webinar, there was something, uh, an important topic that you wanted to discuss with our audience, and that was around early diagnosis. And so um, what would you like to share with, with us today about the importance of, of early diagnosis? Yeah, I think it's important because it helps us move on with our life and you're not stuck with the unknown. The unknown being you're not well, something is wrong, but what is it, you know? Um, it's, it's much more helpful to get a diagnosis. And, and then uh, after my diagnosis, my doctor told me to get my affairs in order, meaning, um, you know, get my will updated, powers of attorney, and I, I made a representation agreement. And then he told me to put my, you know, to travel, like I, like it said in the film. And, and with these things done, it, it allowed me to get on with my life. You know, it just felt like, okay, now let's just start. But, you know, I struggled for a year. Um, and uh, with, like I said in the film, denial and acceptance and bargaining and whatever. Um, and speaking publicly was really hard for me. I'd go to conferences and I'd 
do my talk and then I'd come back to my room and I'd just be shuddering. I'd just be such mixed emotions. What did I just, I just told people I had dementia. Do I really have dementia? And, and then, you know, after a while, yes, you do. And, we went, and you know what really, um, the, the, the good part about that is that I know how many people I helped by talking out. And that really is a great thing that I, that I feel good about. Um, and uh, you know, it makes it makes up for the bad feelings that you have when you're you're having those mixed emotions. It, and you know, it's it, it's so important to try and stay in, independent for as long as possible, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Keep on doing the activities that you usually do, the good ones and the bad ones. Housework <laughs> is always there, <laughs> and um, just just keep on keeping on is my motto. Thank you for sharing that, Lynn. I think so many people do struggle um, at the beginning yeah. and aren't sure what's left for me. Do is this the end? Uh, and that's a, such a common myth that um, people can't live a meaningful life with dementia. And um, you two are living proof that that that's not uh, always a fact. And um, so thank you. And I'm really glad that you did speak up because one uh, amazing thing is that this toolkit has reached 53 different countries around the world. So yeah. by sharing your stories, you have impacted countless people who are then going to carry that information and that knowledge and impact others. And it's just going to have this cascading effect, which we're seeing now with the toolkit. That's an amazing thing. Thank you. Um, Lori, is there any uh, any questions in, in the chat? Any questions or comments for Lynn? It, not so far. It's uh, but just really heartfelt um, b comments. Thank you for normalizing and humanizing this for all of us. You are very brave. That's so inspiring. You're amazing. Thank you for sharing. So. Um, is so far uh, not uh, questions. Um, I'm encouraging people to share if there's questions or I'm wondering whether it resonates with anyone. I was curious if um, people are um, if people are experiencing if anyone has experienced that themselves, whether they had trouble sharing their own diagnoses or maybe had trouble hearing about it from someone else. So, thank you, Lori, and uh, lovely to see that people are being inspired by the video. Um, and yes, please do feel welcome uh, to put any questions, comments that you have into the chat box. Um, <laughs> somebody noticed Myrna had a little visitor there. <laughs> All right, so we're now going to show uh, Myrna's video, which is equally as beautiful and powerful. Um, and so, Lori, if you don't mind pulling that up for us, uh, and again, please do feel free to put anything that comes to mind into the chat box. Stigma is alive and well, and instead of dissipating, it seems to be growing. I'm Myrna Norman. I'm an advocate for people living with dementia as I have dementia as well. I live in Maple Ridge, BC. I have six kids, 12 grandkids, a nine-month-old border collie whose name is Nelson and a great husband, Dave. My situation is not unique and that's important to be said. So I was having some spatial problems. I knew something was wrong and I found a doctor and uh, we went into the office and he came in and he said, I have news for you. You have frontal temporal dementia. You have five to eight years to live. Go home and put your affairs in order. Do you have any questions? Well, I didn't have any questions because I didn't know what he was talking about. Um, so I drove home and um, I wailed. Um, I cried, I tried to make a deal with the devil. I did everything I could. Why wasn't it someone else? Why did I have to get this? All the feelings, sorry for myself, I did in that 10 days. 
I wanted to understand what was happening and everything about the disease that I could understand. Um, I've always felt confident enough in myself that I didn't feel stigma would do me personally much harm. But <laughs> little did I know, sometimes it's just a tiny little comment, but it may hurt us uh, very seriously. And it takes us such a long time to overcome that pain that some people uh, kind of become hermitized by it. Initially, when we were learning that we were going to create a tool, <laughs> we thought of something concrete. We didn't, we didn't for a long time understand the concept of a tool and, and so it, that it would be on the computer, etc. So there were about, I think there were about 10 of us with dementia at that table at the beginning. And it was marvelous to share. Everybody shared their opinions and everybody's opinions were valued. I actually suggested we call it flipping it on its ear. So I'm so, so pleased that, that, that we followed through with that because I think that's what we want to do. We want to completely change that. We want to flip it around instead of making it stigma, let's make it something positive. I guess the point is, is that there's something for everybody. There's something for caregivers, there's something for family members, there's something for healthcare workers. Um, it's an amazing tool. I wish we could get everybody to have a look at it. If somebody was recently diagnosed with dementia, I would say, find some people with dementia to talk to. Um, that's going to be difficult and probably the first place to start is the Alzheimer's Society because then there's a real genuine understanding. There's something that is so something so valuable to those of us with dementia when we are with other people with dementia it's a it's a, a safe safe place and not only do we we understand but we actually really care about our brothers and sisters with dementia it's a, it's a it's a special bond I want people to know that dementia is just a different kind of aging. We need to find ways and, and our communities need to have ways to accept us without trying to um, use lots of medicine to control us. Um, of course we need help um, and we're learning to ask for that when we need it, but we just want to be treated like we're real people, because we are. I've heard one person say that they're really thankful they got dementia. Well, I'm not thankful I got dementia, but I'm really thankful for the opportunities that have come up because of dementia, and one of them being flipping stigma on its ear. Cool. Thank you for that, Marna. Another beautiful video. Um, so many tidbits and insights uh, throughout both of those videos that I think people can take away. Um, so, Marna, when we were uh, sharing uh, before this webinar, uh, you had said that you really wanted to talk about a four letter word <laughs> um, that should be a part of every dementia diagnosis, and that was the H word. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? You know, I don't think that no matter what every human on the earth's problem is, to be able to, to carry on and live their life, they need to have hope. And I'm not sure there's any other disease when one's diagnosed where that word is not given to the patient. And we all have hope for different things. I, I don't particularly need to be cured from my dementia. Um, I'm having a good life. I just need to, to know that, um, that there is hope for me to go on and do other things, to experience joy. Um, when I discovered that I wasn't hopeful at all and that 
I didn't have any joy in my life. I was utterly dumbfounded because I thought, you don't need permission for those things. We just do them. But after having such a devastating dementia um, diagnosis, I did need someone to say, Myrna, have hope, have joy, live your life well. The first time I heard live your life well, I thought, oh, yeah, sure, they don't have dementia. But guess what? You can live well, you can be open and joyful, and you can make your life better. Um, and to, for me to simply say it's up to you is really tough because we need all kinds of external uh, ideas and people in our lives to help us achieve that. So, so just do it. Don't wait for someone else. Just do it. Thank you, Myrna. And I see there's a, a comment in the chat box that talked a little bit about um, what you just spoke about. Where it seems that says it seems that the person is diagnosed with dementia and that is it. They have to find their own way, um, and that's what we really want to see resolved. Um, we don't want that to be the case that people are told to get their affairs in order and it ends there. Yeah. Um, like life doesn't continue on past that point. And so we do hope that everybody is able to connect to support. Um, like both of you have spoken to the importance of finding um, an early stage support group and others who are also walking this journey um, to connect with and the power of that. Um, Lori, is there anything else in the chat? I see a few comments. I haven't had a chance to catch up on them. Anything? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Someone says, thank you for sharing your journeys. You are one of our many whys. We do what we do. So which I thought that was really lovely. Also, somebody asked a question, Myrna, and I thought, oh, I haven't thought of this. Have you ever shared that with the doctor who diagnosed you? Um, the doctor that diagnosed me soon left to go back to um, to South Africa. And then my second doctor left to go down to California. And then, believe it or not, my third doctor left to go to uh, France. Um, and he was really good looking, too. So it was a pleasure, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so it's been difficult with doctors, but it's certainly I'm not shy to say that. And my current doctor tells me that I'm the happiest patient he has in his practice. So I'm really glad to carry that. Is it a moniker or is that the little eyeglass thing? Anyway, I'm ha happy to carry it. Um, I, a question apart from the wonderful work of the Alzheimer's Society and family caregivers at BC, do you, Myrna and Lynn, do you find any other community to belong to, to have fellowship? Myrna, uh, Kim mentioned Purple Angels, and of course you both found your way to the Flipping Stigma group. Um, yeah, are there other communities that you find um, fellowship in and that you belong to? I, I I can answer that. Well, Myrna and I are both involved with research projects, so that keeps us busy quite a bit, right? Uh, <clears throat> different various different ones I, I'm actually too busy and I'm sure Myrna's even busier than me that, that and but being busy even though it could be hard at times we know it's good for us because we knew we know we need to keep our brains active so that that's basically the communities that I you know other with dementia that I'm involved with this other research com communities when I lived in Vancouver I was a part of a support group but uh, I'm not in Vancouver anymore. And, and I um, facilitate Purple Angel Memory Support Cafes, and we have people that are much further than early stage, uh, people that are nonverbal. And, and when they share with me the joy in their eyes, it's just, it's so gratifying to be able to, to share that with another human being. It's, a giving back is is the best the best way to live well. Thank you. And I, I see a comment that says um, 
is there something that it would be helpful if people like directed you to like at the time of diagnosis because not everyone has um, maybe the sense of agency as both of you have is is the comment and so do you have any input on what you think maybe healthcare providers could do to ensure that people make that connection um, we hope that they will refer them uh, to the Alzheimer's Society through First Link. Um, but is there anything else that you would like to get connected to or wish you were connected to? I, I, I wanted, I think for me, it was being connected to the Alzheimer's Society. They really gave me my first, um, well, after my DASNI group, which we had a an online support group also, but before I had a support group with the Alzheimer's Society, but it's important to be with other people who are diagnosed with the same disease. And, you know, some support groups I've heard over the years, they they combine the caregivers and the people with dementia. And I, I honestly believe it's best to have just the people with dementia. You can have a maybe a little last section of their hour, or hour and a half with the caregivers, but not all the time, because it, it it's really important that being diagnosed, you're able to talk to other people diagnosed about your problems and not have your caregiver know how you're feeling about them or whatever. It's just, you know, it's all what what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah, the so support groups were was is number one, I think, for me. Yeah, I, I agree. And um... And I, I think support groups can be more than just sitting around a coffee pot. Uh, we we dance to music and because it's better than exercising, right? It's more fun to dance than, you know, raise your arms 10 times above your head. Uh, we do things like have picnics in the park. So, so those people who want to play bocce, for instance, can do something active. Um, so there's so many ways, but... But it started with Alzheimer's Society. I remember trying to vacuum one morning and I was distraught and I picked up the phone and phoned Alzheimer's and somebody there put me in line with a support group, um, which which Kim and Lori, it's been amazing. So thank you. Yeah, so really encouraging healthcare providers to make that connection i think as early as possible to the alzheimer's society and then from there often opportunities and other connections come we share research opportunities volunteer opportunities advocacy opportunities um and i, I just want to add you know when i did start to speak out and advocate i i had never done that before and what was really helpful for me was that there was a volunteer at the Alzheimer's Society who helped me write my talks that I was giving around the world and doing PowerPoint presentations. So I think, you know, there needs to be a bit of teamwork that could be really helpful for people with dementia that aren't used to doing those things on their own. Mm -hmm. And somebody mentioned in the chat, uh, Minds in Motion which is another great program in the community, um, as well as online, if it isn't in person in your community. Um, and they just talked about how it felt so good to be with people um, living with dementia and their care partners, um, and that their husband living with dementia really enjoyed it. So there are some programs out there, of course, um, you can always have more, but yeah, reaching out, I think, to the Alzheimer's Society, um, and, and let us know what you're looking for as well. What opportunities do you do you hope are out there? All right, so we had one last question um, that I'd like to ask um, you both, and that was about um, how can family members or friends of someone living with dementia support them to continue to do what they love? Because we've heard from both of you that's so key uh, to living well with dementia. Well, I, I think that it's really important that um, the care partner treats the person as if they're not sick, like as if they're not a patient, because if you treat them like a patient, they'll end up acting like a patient and they need to have uh, be allowed to be autonomous. Uh, I think that's so important. And I've seen that over and over with people that um, and it's, it's with good intention that the care partner wants to help the 
person diagnosed, but um, they they really need to hold back a bit and let them do as much, let the person do as much as they can for as long as possible. I think that's really important. Thank you. Oh, Marna, you're on mute. Uh, I think a lot of people with dementia get stuck in a chair uh, doing very little because they feel as though um, they have nothing to contribute. And that's where a, a, a caregiver can say, could you come and help me wash the dishes or would you mind doing this or this or whatever? And by building that up, that gives the person with de dementia a bit more confidence. Um, don't make it things that the person has already lost the skills to do, but offer them things that they can still do so they can feel good about being part of, of the, the whole sort of family group. That's really important. And I've seen it at play. And Erna, you mentioned um, when we were planning about this message for the care partners um, to, to don't worry so much about doing everything perfectly and be kinder to themselves um, okay. and look for those moments of joy and connection. Um, is there anything, any other messages you'd like care partners to know who are, we talked a bit about you're walking this journey together as a family. Yeah. It, it, you know, we can, as a person living with dementia, uh, sometimes it's easy to take the feel sorry for myself road. Um, some days I just want to. And so what? I'm just going to have a day off. Um, and, and that's that's allowed. I mean, we're all different. One person with dementia is just one person. We all uh, we all respond in a different way to to the diagnosis and to our life with it. But we can be happy and people need to know that you can really live a good life. I saw on your on the chat box that you had a note about people from different cultures who are looking for assistance. I, I'm doing a paper on cultural diversity and dementia. And if anybody wanted to get in touch with me, um, I'd be really pleased to chat with them. Thank you, Maureen. Lori, is there any uh, other comments or questions that we might have missed in the chat box? Comment, uh, one comment uh, resonated very much with what you shared, Myrna, about your experience I had had mentioned um, about, and you guys have mentioned about the importance of educating healthcare providers. And uh, the problem is doctors move and patients and caregiver has to go back to square one, ask the family doctor for another or replacement of the former doctor who left. Uh, it could be stressful for patient with dementia and so with the caregiver. Just exactly what you shared, Myrna, about your own experience and you're on doc number four, I believe you said. Um, I will say somebody says Myrna put in apologies for the state of her room in the chat and somebody said, we aren't looking at your house, Myrna. We're here to listen to your story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Oh, sure. Truly lovely. And yes, yeah, someone mentions mentioned there are also, they're called MINT, multi-interdisciplinary team uh, coming to BC as another support right. for those who need cognitive cueing. And I know that for sure, I know there's a couple on Vancouver Island already, uh, the MINT teams. And yeah, hopefully, that that can also, um, it, it can really expand through the province. Someone says the caregiver also goes through the denial, et cetera. Did Myrna or Lynn have that, where perhaps um, one of your primary supports uh, also went through that denial and grieving process? Lynn? Yeah, yeah, I can speak to that because um, I had to move home and live with my parents and uh, they were in denial for the longest time until they, till they, you know, I started living with them and they could see my deficiencies. And, and then after a while, they really knew that I did have a, uh, you know, I, 
I do have a problem with my frontal lobes. Um, and then, you know, I, I, the, the shoe was on the other foot too because I saw my father develop a dementia and be care looking after him. And first of all, you know, he, I was, oh, that's, you know, that's my dad. He's not developing any problems, but then he did. And he, so I, I can see it on both that the caregiver can go through the, those stages also. Yes. Yeah. And it took my husband a very long time to come to terms with the fact. But, you know, Lynn would probably agree with me when I say there's times when her and I probably go, Hmm, I did that quite well. Do I really have dementia? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both. I think um, we are almost drawing near to the end of our, our time together. Is there a final uh, comment or message that you'd like to share with our audience today? Well, I, I like um, Myrna's uh, H word because, you know, everybody has to have hope and it doesn't matter what kind of a doctor you go to. And they, they a lot of them really try and uh, portray that, that there is hope with your diagnosis, uh, not necessarily the dementia, but other others also. And, and it's helpful. It really is. Yeah. And there's a famous song, I don't know who sings it, but it's called, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Yeah. Life is so short. And as we age, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So don't worry, be happy. And then I'll add one more thing that my mother instilled in me right from day one, when after I had to move home, just live one day at a time. You know, don't worry about too much of the future. Just enjoy today and be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Yeah. Oh, there is. Sorry. I was just going to say there is a question as come in. Myrna, could you please share more about the cultural diversity paper that you mentioned? There is a couple of people are saying they would love to collaborate. And just if people haven't noticed, Myrna did share her. Uh, email address in the chat. So if you do want to reach out. But yeah, can you tell us a bit more about the cultural diversity paper? I can tell you that I've lived a lot of my life with blinkers on. And, and I started thinking about, you know, if I were black and had dementia, how would I be treated? Like, you know, that it's if I was First Nations, how would I be treated by the whites? If I was Asian, how would I be treated? Um, and that brings up some really important questions about society. And instead of putting us in little boxes, I don't know why we always want to put people in little boxes, but opening up. So I think we all need to have a good look at, at culture, how different cultures actually experience dementia, um, and how the general society responds to those people. Um, I can tell you I'm totally ignorant about the topic, and I'm just trying to get people to talk to. Um, I'm working with a group of people from Waterloo, Ontario, and uh, we're going to write this paper, I believe, at the end of November. But I want to go, I want to be able to write this paper, not with some preconceived ideas I have, but some real um, word of mouth information. So thank you. My my email is in the chat. And uh, if you're interested, please send me an email. I think if you can follow the framework that the toolkit has laid out where you have embedded the voices of people with lived experience, it would be, I think, wonderful to bring more cultural diversity um, to that work, as we know people um, experience varying degrees of stigma um, that can be based off a dementia diagnosis or many other things. And so um, that's exciting that you're going to be exploring that. And I hope that you get lots of uh, feedback and people participate. Thank you. It looks like there already are some people uh, wanting to, to collaborate with you, which is lovely. Uh, I'm part of a study that I see someone saying they're living alone with dementia. And um, if they're interested in being, you know, in a part of our group that we're looking at that issue, 
maybe they could contact the Alzheimer's Society and I could put them in contact with the researcher if, if that's interesting to them. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, I know that getting involved in these types of projects um, has brought so much uh, meaning and purpose to to your lives, and I I think you've probably inspired many people to um, to get involved. So thank you. And if anyone um, doesn't want to reach out direct or um, is unsure, uh, I've put our um, learn from home email address in the chat, learn from home at alzheimerbc.org. And you can just ask in that email, uh, let us know uh, if you can mention Kim's name, that would be helpful. It'll make it easier for us to redirect it to the right place. Um, and just let us know that, that you do want to be um, participate in a research project with Lynn or Myrna or would just like to know more about those. To support you, Connors, uh, on the dementia journey, the Alzheimer's Society of BC is collaborating with the Yukon government to launch the new First Link Yukon Dementia Helpline, specifically for people living in the Yukon. So Yukoners can now reach out to the helpline, uh, calling the toll-free number on your screen, 1-888-852-2579. And it is available Monday to Friday from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And that is for you to access help and guidance as needed. And then we also have um, our English speaking dementia helpline, uh, which is available Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. for anybody across BC. And that is 1-800-936-6033. And then we also have helplines for the Chinese and South Asian communities, which are available from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So if you do have further questions, you want to know how you can get involved with some of the programming that the Alzheimer's Society is doing or volunteer opportunities, please do feel free to reach out uh, to us through the First Link Dementia Helpline. Um, and then just thank you so much. Uh, for being here today to learn a little bit more about the Flipping Stigma Toolkit, please do go and check out that resource, share it with your friends and family, your healthcare providers, um, and watch all four of the beautiful videos that they created. They truly, each one is very powerful and it's in its own right. So thank you, Myrna, and thank you, Lynn, thank so you. much uh, for being here today. I can see that there's a flood of thank yous coming in into the chat box and people really appreciate uh, hearing from you today. So thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.